What is Ma's scale of hardness? Mo's scale of hardness, also seen as Mo's hardness scale, Mo's scale. Or even erroneously as Mo's scale, was invented by German mineralogist Friedrich Mo's, 1773 to 1839. This arbitrary scale measures hardness or the scratch resistance of minerals and is often used as a quick way to help identify minerals in the field and laboratory. But the numbers assigned to the various minerals are not proportional to their actual scratch resistance. Thus, the main reason for using the scale is to know that a mineral with a lower number can be scratched by a mineral with a higher number. Although the Richter scale is mentioned most often in the media when a quake occurs. There is a more precise scale in use today that is based on the mathematics of motions caused by the earthquake. Called moment magnitude, this method uses a physical quantity related to the total energy released in the quake, which is called a moment. Seismologists can also deduce moment magnitude from a false geometry in the field or a seismogram reading. Scientists occasionally use moment magnitude when describing an earthquake event to the public. But because the concept is so difficult to explain the number is often translated into the Richter scale. What are some details of Jean-Baptiste Fourier's life? The accomplishments of French mathematician and physicist Baron Jean-Baptiste Joseph Fourier 1768-1830, prove that not all famous mathematicians did just math. Fourier was a teacher, became involved in the messy French Revolution, and was arrested for his views and imprisoned in 1794, for a time. He even feared the guillotine, but political changes resulted in Fourier being freed. By 1798 Fourier joined Napoleon's army in its invasion of Egypt as a scientific advisor. After Napoleon lost the Battle of the Nile to Nelson and was confined to Malta, Fourier continued his work in Egypt. Establishing educational facilities there and carrying out archaeological explorations. Back in France with Napoleon in 1801. He supervised the draining of the swamps of Bourguin and the construction of a highway from Grenoble to Turin. He also spent time writing Description of Egypt, a book that Napoleon edited, and included some historical rewrites. By the second edition of the book, Napoleon himself would be completely edited out of the text. As if he wasn't busy enough, during this time Fourier wrote his now famous 1807 paper on the propagation of heat in solid bodies. A mathematical work on the theory of heat that presented one of his major contributions, the Fourier series. But it was an uphill battle to get approval from his peers. In 1811 he submitted his 1807 ideas for a mathematics prize. Along with additional work on the cooling of infinite solids and on terrestrial and radiant heat. Only one other entry was received, making Fourier's work the obvious winner. Finally, by 1822, 
he published his 1811 essay. Making the techniques of Fourier analysis available to everyone. To this day, the functions that he worked out have a multitude of applications in engineering, science, and mathematics. What is a Fourier series? The idea for the Fourier series was developed by French mathematician and physicist Baron Jean Baptiste Joseph Fourier. 1768 to 1830, as an alternate method of expressing a function by the expansion of the function. A Fourier series is actually a specific type of infinite mathematical series that involves trigonomic functions. More simply put, it is essentially an infinite sum of sine waves. The Fourier series is used in applied mathematics. In engineering and physics, it is used to split up a periodic, or continuous, function into a group of simpler terms, in electronics. It is used to express the periodic function seen in waveforms of communication signals. What is the least squares method? This mathematical procedure called either the least squares method or the method of least squares. Finds the best fitting curve for a given set of points by minimizing the sum of the squares of all deviations from the curve. It is often used in engineering for fluid flow. Certain elasticity problems and diffusion and convection in materials. What is sea level? Sea level is the height of the ocean's surface at a certain spot and depends on changing conditions. It is also the basis for most Earth surface measurements. Because sea levels are used as a reference point in determining land elevations and ocean depths, scientists have averaged out the highest and lowest altitudes and depths from sea level locations. The highest is Mount Everest, Nepal, Tibet, which measures 29,022 feet, 7 inches, 8,846 meters, above sea level. The lowest on land is the Dead Sea, Israel, Jordan, which measures 1,299 feet, 396 meters, below sea level. The greatest depth below sea level is the Mariana Trench in the Pacific Ocean. A deep chasm measuring 36,201 feet, 11,033 meters, below sea level. How has math been used historically in architecture? Historically, there has been a great connection between architecture and mathematics. Ancient mathematicians were architects and vice versa, using their skills to build pyramids, temples, aqueducts, cathedrals, and a range of other architectural structures we find beautiful and awesome today. 
For example, in ancient Greece and Rome, architects were required to also be mathematicians. During medieval times, most buildings and structures carried some symbolic reference to the church. The mathematical end of architecture was almost forgotten during this time. By the European Renaissance around 1400, a new kind of architecture developed that emphasized mass and interior space to produce aesthetically pleasing pictures similar to those found in paintings and sculptures. This led to an entirely new way of looking at architecture and altered its connection to mathematics. What famous structures were built using mathematics? Actually, all famous structures needed mathematics. Especially in the initial phases of design and construction. Some of the more famous and exceptionally challenging buildings include the Chrysler Building in New York. A steel frame skyscraper built around 1930 that was the tallest building in the world before the Empire State Building. The Empire State Building in New York, a steel-framed, stone-clad commercial office skyscraper. Built in 1931 that rises 1,252 feet 381 meters high, the Eiffel Tower in Paris, France. Designed by architect Gustave Eiffel and built between 1887 and 1889 as a 985-foot 300-meter-tall exposition iron observation tower. And the Sears Tower in Chicago, built between 1974 to 1976, it is a steel frame with glass stroke. Tour standing at 1,450 feet 442 meters tall and is, to date, the tallest building in the United States. Places such as the Monterey Aquarium, built around 1980 with reinforced concrete and made compatible. With surrounding waterfront structures, also needed mathematics in order to be constructed. Of course, when one gets down to it. All types of construction require some math knowledge for them to be built, even a modest piece of cabinetry. How do geologists measure the intensity of earthquakes? Geologists measure the intensity of earthquakes in order to compare and judge potential damage. One of the first standard ways to measure intensity was developed in 1902 by Italian seismologist Giuseppe Mercalli, 1850-1914, and is called the Mercalli Intensity Scale. It was later modified and renamed the Modified Mercalli Intensity Scale. The numbers, in Roman numerals from I to 12, represent the subjective measurement of an earthquake's strength based on its effects on local populations and structures. For example, Roman numeral V on the scale represents a quake felt by nearly everyone. With some dishes and windows broken, unstable objects overturned. And disturbances of trees, poles, and other tall objects sometimes noticed. But scientists wanted a more solid, less subjective scale. One of the first scales developed to measure the true magnitude was invented by American seismologist Charles Francis Richter. 1900 to 1985, 
and German born seismologist Bino Gutenberg, 1889 to 1960. In 1935, these scientists borrowed the idea of magnitude from astronomers. Stellar brightness is measured by magnitude, defining earthquake magnitude as how fast the ground moved. As measured on a particular seismograph a specific distance from the quake's epicenter. The Richter scale is not a physical scale like a ruler. But rather a mathematical construct it is not linear, but logarithmic. Thus. An increase in each whole number on the scale represents a tenfold increase in power. Its numbers represent the maximum amplitude of seismic waves that occur 62 miles. 100 kilometers, from the epicenter of an earthquake. Because seismographs are usually not located at this exact interval. The magnitudes are deduced using the arrival of specific waves of energy given off when an earthquake occurs. How do scientists use mean sea level in connection with global climate change? Many scientists are interested in the long-term mean sea level change. Especially in connection with global climate change. By taking such long-term measurements, these scientists are hoping to confirm the predictions of several climate models, including the idea that global warming is a result of the greenhouse gases from either human or natural sources. There are two major ways to determine such sea level variations. The first estimates sea level changes using tide gauge measurements, mathematically averaging the numbers. Graphs of the most recent estimates using this method show a 0.669 to 0.960 inch. 1.7 to 2.44 mm, rise in sea level per year. The second method uses Global Positioning System, GPS, devices and satellite altimeter measurements. Both of which accurately pinpoint global ocean heights quickly and more efficiently. For example, from 1994 to 2004, Scientists mathematically constructed graphs from satellite altimeter measurements, showing that the global mean sea levels have risen anywhere between 1.10 and 1.18 inches, 2.8 and 3.0 millimeters. No matter what the method, scientists do know the global mean sea levels are slowly rising. Many believe that about one quarter of the rise is caused by thermal expansion as the oceans warm. And another one quarter by small glaciers melting around the world. Some rise may also be caused by such human activities as burning trees. Pumping groundwater, and draining wetlands. Currently. Scientists are not quite certain about the true rate of sea level rise. Mainly because of the intensity of working on the data, ocean tide gauge records must be averaged. Over many decades, and corrected for variable ocean dynamics and distortions of Earth's crust. How are modeling and simulation used in engineering?
modeling and simulation have become an essential part of engineering on both a small and large scale. Because building any size of structure takes time and money. Engineers often develop a mathematical model, a set of equations that describe what may happen to a structure if it is built the way it is represented by the model. Using a computer, or graphic, representation gives the engineers a three-dimensional view. For example, before the space shuttle was built. Engineers used mathematical modeling to simulate what the craft would look like in three dimensions. In this way, the engineers learned how the shuttle would fly. How strong the heat-resistant tiles had to be in order to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. And even how to maneuver the shuttle under various conditions as it landed. The computer was the only way to solve such problems without real-life testing. It quickly and easily solved a plethora of mathematical equations especially calculus and differential equations that represented how the shuttle would take off, fly, and land. What is mean sea level? Mean sea level, MSL, is the average water level, height of the sea, for all stages of a tide. Locally, MSL is measured by tidal gauges at one or more points over a given period of time. The resulting numbers average out wind waves and other periodic changes in sea level. The overall values of a MSL are measured with respect to level marks on land called benchmarks. Thus, scientists know a true change in MSL is either from a change in sea level from, for example, possible global warming effects, or changes in the gauge's height on land, such as in the case of local uplift. There is also a more mathematically intensive way to determine the MSL. To a geodesist, a person who studies the shape of the Earth, MSL is determined by comparing measured heights of the global mean sea surface, MSS, above a level reference surface called a geoidae mathematical model of an ellipsoid shape that approximates Earth's mean sea level. This comparison is done because the Earth does not have a geometrically perfect shape, for example. The Atlantic Ocean north of the Gulf Stream is about 3.3 feet, 1 meter, lower than it is farther south. The MSS is not a level surface, thanks to such factors as currents created by wind. As well as atmospheric cooling and heating that cause differences in sea levels around the world. But interestingly enough, it never differs from the global geoid by more than about 6.56 feet, 2 meters. Why is finite element analysis important to many industries? Finite element analysis, FIA, is important to various industries especially those that need to predict failure of a structure, object, or material when under unknown stresses because it allows designers to understand all of the theoretical stresses within the structure. This cuts manufacturing costs that would occur if a sample of the structure was actually built and tested. FIA uses a complex system of points, nodes, 
making up a grid called a mesh. The mesh is programmed to contain all the material, properties, and other factors that constitute the structure and determine how it will react to certain load conditions. Such as thermal, gravitational, pressure, or point loads. The nodes are then assigned a density throughout the material. All depending on the stress levels anticipated in a certain area. In general, points with more stress, such as corners of a building or contact points on a car frame, will usually have a higher node density than those with little or no stress. As researchers examine the results of the FIA, they learn how the structure responds to the various stresses. In this way, a prototype of the structure won't have to be built until the majority of the theoretical kinks are worked out of the system. How are the shapes of crystals classified? Geometry plays an important part in the study of minerals. This is because certain minerals exhibit specific shapes called crystals. With specific crystalline forms occurring when a mineral's atoms join in a particular pattern or internal structure. This arrangement is determined by several factors. Including the chemistry and structure of the mineral's atoms, or even the environment in which the crystal grew. Overall, there are specific angles between corresponding faces of all crystals. Mineralogists, scientists who study minerals, divide these crystalline forms into 32 geometric classes of symmetry. They use this information to identify and classify certain minerals. The crystals are also subdivided into seven systems on the basis of an imaginary straight line that passes through a crystal center, or axis. The seven groups include cubic, or isometric, tetragonal, orthorhombic, monoclinic, triclinic, hexagonal, and trigonal, or rhombohedral. For example, a crystal in the cubic system has three axes that intersect at right angles. The axes are also of equal lengths. The best way to envision this crystal is to think of a box with equal sides or a cube. Why is Laplace transform important in engineering? Laplace transform is a way to solve linear differential equations and translate them into simple algebraic problems that are easier to solve. It was developed by French mathematician and theoretician Marquis Pierre Simon de Laplace, 1749-1827. Although it carries his name, the Laplace transform seems to have been first used by Denis Poisson, 1781-1840, in 1815. Today, it is used extensively in electrical engineering problems. What is the difference between the Earth's sidereal and solar days?
The difference between the Earth's side real and solar days has to do with angles and the Earth's rotation. The mean solar day is equal to 24 hours, or the average of all the solar days in an orbital year. The mean side real day is 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 04.09053 seconds. It is not exactly equal to a solar day because by the time the Earth has rotated once, it has moved a little in its orbit around the Sun. Thus, it rotates for about another 4 minutes before the Sun is considered to be back in exactly the same place in the sky as it was the day before. The actual divisions of geologic time are not arbitrary, or uniform. The larger divisions are based on major events that occurred sporadically over the Earth's long history. For example, the end of the Permian period, about 240 million years ago, was marked by a major catastrophe. Some scientists estimate that close to 90% of all species on the Earth died at that time. Resulting in a major extinction event that may have been caused by huge volcanic eruptions or even a space object striking the Earth. The smaller divisions are usually based on specific local structures or fossils found within the rock. Most often they are named after local towns, people, and sundry other nearby associations. Why did the Egyptians choose the pyramid form? Historians know that the Egyptian sun god, with its rays reaching for the sun, was represented by pyramid-shaped stones, or ben-bens. And because the Egyptians worshipped the sun as their chief god, the pyramids are thought to be huge renditions of the Ben-Bens. After a pharaoh died, the pyramids would be symbolic of the pharaoh ascending the sun's rays to join his sun god. Some historians also believe that the pyramids may have had some, still hidden, numerical significance. In particular, some believe the ratio of the pyramid's perimeter to its height times 2. Or p-2xh, gives a close approximation to the value of pi. Another claim is that the slopes of the pyramid's sides were also expressions of pi. What is a finite element analysis? A finite element analysis, also known as FIA or finite element method, is a powerful tool to solve problems in engineering, especially for heat transfer, fluid mechanics and mechanical system problems. The FIA consists of a computer model of a material or design that is stressed, the outcome is then analyzed for specific results. In reality, the computer is conducting a numerical analysis technique used for solving differential equations and relating it to stress in the engineering problem. This technique was first developed in 1943 by Richard Courant, 1888-1972, who used a form of FIA to find approximate solutions to vibrational systems. Early in the 1970s, 
only companies that owned expensive mainframe computers were using FIA. Including the aeronautic, automotive, defense, and nuclear industries. Since the mid-1990s, however, use of FIA has grown with the advent of faster and cheaper computers with more memory. The results are more accurate, too. Allowing various industries to analyze new product designs and refine existing products. What types of mathematics are used in engineering? Mathematics is definitely a necessity in engineering. Especially the fields of algebra, geometry, calculus, and statistics. Certain divisions of engineering rely on variations of mathematics. Including combinations of arithmetic, algebra, geometry, calculus, differential equations. Probability and statistics, complex analysis, and others. For example, civil and structural engineers use a great deal of linear algebra and work with matrices. Mechanical engineers use logs and exponents, calculus, differential equations, and probability, and statistics and a chemical engineer uses such mathematics as algebra and geometry. Logs and exponents, integral calculus, and differential equations. Who was Vitruvius? Marcus Vitruvius Pollio, c. 1st century BCE, was a Roman writer, architect, and engineer. He was the author of De Architectural Libri de CM, known today as the Ten Books of Architecture. This Latin treatise, dedicated to Octavian. The heir and adopted son of Julius Caesar, was written around 27 BCE. For more about Octavian, see mathematics throughout history. Possibly the first works published about architecture, the books entailed a compilation of architectural ideas of Vitruvius's day and covered the following ten subjects, principles of architecture. History of Architecture and Architectural Materials, Ionic Temples, Doric and Corinthian Temples. Public Buildings, Theatres, Music, Baths, and Harbours, Town and Country Houses. Interior Decoration, Water Supply, Dials and Clocks, and Mechanical Engineering with Military Applications. Specifically. The topics included such forward-thinking ideas as the manufacture of building materials and dyes. Material science, machines for heating water for public baths, chemical engineering. Amplification in amphitheaters, acoustical engineering, and the design of roads and bridges, civil engineering. The architecture was wildly successful, and Vitruvius's architectural advice was followed for centuries. But because Vitruvius's books were passed down through the ages, they were copied by various people, especially throughout the Middle Ages. Many medieval engineers added information to the texts. Treating the books as handbooks, not documents to be preserved. 
In the end, historians have had to winnow away the added sections to find the true writings of Vitruvius. What is the historical significance of the Golden Ratio? It is thought that over the centuries many architects and painters used the Golden Ratio in their works. Some historians believe that the Great Pyramid of Cheops contains the Golden Ratio. The ancient Greeks knew about the golden ratio from their works in geometry. But they never truly believed it was as important as numbers such as pi. Many works of art in the Renaissance are thought to have used the golden ratio within paintings and sculptures. Although it may have been subconsciously incorporated into their compositions. In 1509 Luca Paciola published the work Divina Proportion, which explored the mathematics of the golden ratio, along with its use in architectural design. Of course, humans aren't the only ones who practice the golden ratio. It is also seen in nature as the result of the dynamics of some systems. For example, the spacing of sunflower seeds and even the shape of the chambered nautilus shell are often claimed to be related to the golden ratio. What is the longest span of time measured on the geologic time scale? The longest span of time measured on the geologic time scale is the Precambrian era. Also called the Precambrian Aeon. It represents the time between 4.55 billion years to about 544 million years ago. Or about 7 eighths of the Earth's history. This time period includes the beginning of the Earth's formation, its cooldown, its crust's formation. And, within the last billion years of the time period, the evolution of the first single tzelet to multi tzelet organisms. The demarcation of 544 million years ago represents a burst in the evolution of multi tzelet organisms, including the first plant and animal species. What is a carrot? A carat is a unit of measurement representing the weight of precious stones, pearls, and certain metals, such as gold. It was originally a unit of mass based on the carob seed or bean used by ancient merchants. In the Middle East, in terms of weight measurement, a carat equals 3 and 1 fifth grains troy and it is also divided into four grains, sometimes referred to as carat grains. Diamonds and other precious stones are estimated by carats and fractions of carats. Pearls are usually measured by carat grains, for more about grains and measurement, see mathematics throughout history. Carats of gold are measured based on the number of twenty-fourths of pure gold. For example, 24 karat gold is pure gold, but for a goldsmith standard, it is actually 22 parts gold, 1 part copper, and 1 part silver, as real gold is too malleable to hold its shape, 18 karat gold is 75% pure. 
14 karat gold is 58.33% pure, and 10 karat gold is 41.67% pure gold. How are the principles of ratio, proportion, and symmetry applied to architecture? The definition of a ratio is a comparison by division of two quantities expressed as the same unit measurement. For example, a building that is 200 feet wide and 100 feet tall has a ratio of 2 colon 1, 200 colon 100, between its width and height. It is also seen as the fraction 1 half. Such a relationship was understood as far back as ancient Greece and Rome. When people used mathematics to give structure and aesthetics to buildings. This is especially important in architecture. In which building design is based on complex mathematical ratios. Proportion is an equation stating that two ratios are equal. Every proportion has four terms, with the first and fourth terms being the extremes. The second and third terms are called the means. In each proportion, the product of the means equals the product of the extremes. The Greeks and Romans often used proportions in their buildings and other structural designs. The Roman architect Vitruvius was also instrumental in praising the virtues of proportion and symmetry in architecture, for more about Vitruvius, see above. During the Renaissance, architects applied proportion, and other mathematical formulas to produce aesthetically pleasing buildings beauty that still holds true today. Although there are other types of symmetry, the most common is line symmetry. In which a line divides an object, line, or other structure into two equal halves. An example in nature would be the wings of a butterfly. If a line of symmetry is drawn, each point on one side of the line has a corresponding point on the opposite side of the line. If you connect these two points, the line is perpendicular to the line of symmetry. There is a more mathematical way of defining symmetry. Two points are symmetric about a line if the line is the perpendicular bisector of the segment joining the two points. Symmetry was used by ancient, and modern, architects to maintain visual and sometimes structural balance of a building or structure. How do geologists use angles to understand rock layers? Mathematics especially geometry is instrumental in understanding rock layers. In a branch of geology called stratigraphy, scientists measure angles and planes in rock in order to know the location of certain rock layers and the possible geologic events that affected the layers over time. In particular, geologists measure strike and dip. Strike is the angle between true north and a horizontal line contained in any planar feature. Such as a fault, usually caused by an earthquake. Or inclined bed, often caused by the uplift of hot molten rock around a volcano. Dip is the angle at which a bed or rock vein is inclined to the horizontal. 
it is measured perpendicular to the strike and in the vertical plane, as opposed to the strike's horizontal line. What are the modern connections between architecture and mathematics? The foundations of modern architecture began with mathematics. Mathematical planning goes into creating almost every working, freestanding structure. From the smallest monument to the tallest buildings and bridges. For example, in order to build a structure, the area where the building will be erected must be measured to see if it will fit. Measurements and surveys, then the building plans need to be drawn up in. Scale drawings made proportionally smaller to the structure's real size, for more information. See below, and the amount of building material must be estimated, mathematics to figure out the budget. Finally, the actual structure must be built to specifications so. The building will stand without collapsing, geometry and measurement. What are interpolation and extrapolation? Interpolation in mathematics involves finding a value, or outcome, of a function between already known values. In other words, it is a method of estimating the values in between sampled data points. Extrapolation in mathematics is estimating the value of a problem beyond the range covered by the existing data. Both methods are used a great deal in engineering. How is modeling and simulation used in geology? Like so many other fields of science, mathematical modeling and simulation is used in geology to understand the intricacies of physical events in the past, present, and future. For example, hydrologists, geologists who study water flow above and below the Earth's surface, often use models to simulate the effects of increased groundwater pumping of wells. They may also use a simulation to determine how much water can be presently pumped out of a well. Or how much can be pumped out in the future without harm to the environment. Other hydrologists may use modeling to understand the flow of water in a river. Bay or estuary, for example, to determine how the water erodes a shoreline. Still other researchers may model how snow on a volcanic mountain melts, gathers debris, and potentially flows toward populated areas during an eruption event. For more about modeling and simulation, see Math in Computing. What is meteorology? Meteorology is the study of atmospheric phenomena, their interactions and processes. It is often considered part of the earth sciences and is most commonly associated with weather and weather forecasting.
What are scale drawings? Scale drawings are drawings or illustrations that are proportional in scale to the real structures they represent. In order for a new building to be designed, an architect must convert his or her ideas to drawings. But since the drawings can't be as large as the building, the architect uses scale drawings to depict the structure. These miniature versions of the actual structure show the sizes, shapes, and arrangements of rooms. Along with structural parts, windows, doors, closets, and other important details of construction. The scale drawings of these buildings must be in exact proportion to the actual structure. With various scales used for this purpose. For example, one eighth inch might be used to represent one foot, thus. An eight foot long building feature would be drawn as an inch long on paper. One of the most common scales used by architects is one fourth inch equals one foot. These measurements can also be translated into the metric scale. Scale drawings are also used in other engineering fields, such as surveying. For example, distances measured in the field can be translated to a smaller scale. Such as a drawing, in order to accurately depict what was measured. The ratio between the real distance and the drawn distance is called the drawing scale. If the measurement is 200 feet in the field and on paper the desired line is 8 inches long. Then 8 inches on the paper would equal 200 feet on the ground, and 1 inch would be equal to 25 feet on the ground. This is translated as a diagram with a scale of 1 equals 25, 1 inch equals 25 feet. Or 125. There is another way of approaching such an illustration. If the longest distance measured in the field was 300 feet and the desired drawing scale is 1 inch equals 25 feet. Then the minimum length of paper needed would be 12 inches, or 300 slash 25. What is the golden ratio? The golden ratio, also known as extreme and mean ratio, golden section, golden mean, or divine proportion, is a number that has many interesting properties. It is associated with the balance between symmetry and asymmetry used in art and design. Two quantities are said to be in the golden ratio if the whole is to the larger as the larger is to the smaller. Euclid expressed it as, a straight line is said to have been cut in extreme and mean ratio when as the whole line is to the greater segment, so is the greater to the less. This is seen in the accompanying illustration, in which for two segments A and B, the entire line is to the A segment as A is to the B segment. How did people in the Renaissance approach architecture? During the Renaissance, not only mathematics but also architecture made great strides. In particular, 
church buildings were no longer based on the shape of the cross, but rather on the circle. This is because Renaissance architects believed that ancient mathematicians equated circles with geometric perfection. And that the circle must then represent the perfection of God. In what way do some historians link mathematics to the pyramids? The pyramids in Egypt were built as royal tombs for the pharaohs first along the edges of cliffs as low rectangular structures called mastabas, then as tall, four-sided pyramids. The three structures most of us associate with pyramids were built at Giza, near Cairo, about 2500 BC. The largest of these, the Great Pyramid of the Pharaoh Cheops, measures 481 feet, 147 meters, high. But there are no intricate pathways in this pyramid. It is merely a pile of limestone blocks weighing between 3 and 15 tons. What types of analyses interest engineers? There are several types of analyses that interest engineers, all of which involve mathematical modeling. Structural analysis deals with linear and nonlinear models and stresses on a material. The linear models assume the material does not plastically deform, the remaining deformation after the load causing it is removed. Nonlinear models stress the material past its elastic capabilities. The stresses in the material then vary with the amount of deformation. Vibrational analysis deals with possible resonance and subsequent failure. It is used to test a material that may experience random vibrations, impacts, or shocks. Fatigue analysis is used to determine the life of a material or structure. It shows the effects of occasional, periodic, or cyclic loading on a structure or object. Pointing out where cracks or fractures are most likely to occur. Engineers measure heat transfer to determine a material or structure's conductivity or thermal fluid dynamics. In this way, researchers understand how a material will respond to various hot and cold conditions or even how it diffuses heat and cold over time. How is mathematics important to electrical engineering? There are many branches of mathematics that are important to electrical engineering. For example, abstract math is used in communication and signal processing. Complex differential equations solving equations involving derivatives are used in circuit theory and systems design. Also in circuit theory, engineers need to know algebra and trigonometry. Engineers who deal with electromagnetism need to know calculus, especially Maxwell's equations. For more about Maxwell, see Math in the Physical Sciences.
How is mathematics important to electrical engineering? There are many branches of mathematics that are important to electrical engineering. For example, abstract math is used in communication and signal processing. Complex differential equations solving equations involving derivatives are used in circuit theory and systems design. Also in circuit theory, engineers need to know algebra and trigonometry. Engineers who deal with electromagnetism need to know calculus, especially Maxwell's equations. For more about Maxwell, see Math in the Physical Sciences. How is mathematics used to determine resistor values in an electrical network? Electrical engineers who deal with systems and circuit theory need to know the terms and functions of the basic circuit element resistor, capacitor and inductor in terms of current voltage associations determined by impedance, obstruction. Complex numbers, calculus, and Laplace transforms, see above. Are all mathematical concepts used to understand circuit theory? The best way to understand the basics are through the following simple equations. Resistor voltage equals current, I, times resistance, R, or V equals IR. Capacitor voltage equals the square root of minus 1, J, often called I, or an imaginary number, times frequency. W, times the capacitance, C, all times the current, I, or V equals, JWC, I. Inductor voltage equals the current divided by the square root of minus 1, J, times frequency, W, times inductance, L, or V equals I slash, JWL. How is mathematics used to determine resistor values in an electrical network? Electrical engineers who deal with systems and circuit theory need to know the terms and functions of the basic circuit element resistor, capacitor, and inductor in terms of current voltage associations determined by impedance, obstruction. Complex numbers, calculus, and Laplace transforms, see above. Are all mathematical concepts used to understand circuit theory? The best way to understand the basics are through the following simple equations. Resistor voltage equals current, I, times resistance, R, or V equals IR. Capacitor voltage equals the square root of minus 1, J, often called I, or an imaginary number, times frequency w times the capacitance c all times the current i or v equals jwc i inductor voltage equals the current divided by the square root of minus 1 j times frequency w times inductance l or v equals i slash jwl How are imaginary numbers used in electrical engineering?
imaginary numbers are used in electrical engineering because complex numbers are an integral part of electrical problems. In fact, there are often more imaginary numbers in electrical engineering problems than there are real numbers. This is because a complex number is a pair of numbers in which one number is real. The other imaginary, or a real number multiplied by the value i, defined as the square root of minus 1, for more information about imaginary numbers, see Math Basics. For instance, we know electricity flows through an electrical circuit component such as a light bulb. The bulb actually resists the flow of some electricity by doing work or shining thus. The current is real and measured by a current meter. But if the current can't flow through a device, the current becomes imaginary. For example, a capacitor is two pieces of metal that do not touch. Therefore, if one adds a voltage, no real current can flow through it. How are imaginary numbers used in electrical engineering? Imaginary numbers are used in electrical engineering because complex numbers are an integral part of electrical problems. In fact, there are often more imaginary numbers in electrical engineering problems than there are real numbers. This is because a complex number is a pair of numbers in which one number is real. The other imaginary, or a real number multiplied by the value i, defined as the Square root of minus 1, for more information about imaginary numbers, see Math Basics. For instance, we know electricity flows through an electrical circuit component such as a light bulb. The bulb actually resists the flow of some electricity by doing work or shining thus. The current is real and measured by a current meter. But if the current can't flow through a device, the current becomes imaginary. For example, a capacitor is two pieces of metal that do not touch. Therefore, if one adds a voltage, no real current can flow through it. Is math used to describe the strength of materials? Material science is also a major part of engineering, and includes a great deal of mathematics. For example, engineers need to know how materials stand up to stress and strain from the pressure of either a structure or overlying materials. A basic understanding of how structures respond to the action of forces and how these forces affect the performance of various building materials, such as wood, steel, concrete, and so on, is essential. Is math used to describe the strength of materials? Material science is also a major part of engineering, and includes a great deal of mathematics. For example, engineers need to know how materials stand up to stress and strain from the pressure of either a structure or overlying materials. 
a basic understanding of how structures respond to the action of forces and how these forces affect the performance of various building materials, such as wood, steel, concrete, and so on, is essential. Are advances in technology fundamental to our understanding of materials? Yes, advances in technology are truly fundamental to our understanding of materials, and vice versa. For example, transistors and superconductors were developed by Understanding the mathematics of the materials that make up these objects. Math and materials science together have also advanced technology used in infrastructure. Such as highways and overpasses, aerospace, such as satellites and shuttles. And microelectronics, such as those found in automobiles. Today, the need to describe material behavior resulting from physical interactions is forcing scientists to develop new mathematics. In fact, material science has evolved to the point in which researchers from physics, engineering, and applied mathematics are working together on common problems. Are advances in technology fundamental to our understanding of materials? Yes, advances in technology are truly fundamental to our understanding of materials, and vice versa. For example, transistors and superconductors were developed by Understanding the mathematics of the materials that make up these objects. Math and materials science together have also advanced technology used in infrastructure. Such as highways and overpasses, aerospace, such as satellites and shuttles. And microelectronics, such as those found in automobiles. Today, the need to describe material behavior resulting from physical interactions is forcing scientists to develop new mathematics. In fact, material science has evolved to the point in which researchers from physics, engineering, and applied mathematics are working together on common problems. How is mathematics used in chemical engineering? Mathematics is used a great deal in chemical engineering. Especially since chemical engineers design materials and the processes by which those materials are made. To solve chemical problems, Many types of mathematics are used, not least of which is calculus, including partial differential equations. Even simple calculations, such as working on chemical formulas and equations, involve mathematics. For more information about chemical formulas and equations, see Math in the Physical Sciences. Traditionally, chemical engineers worked in the petroleum and large-scale chemical industries. More recently, they have spread out to the pharmaceutical, foodstuff, polymer and material, microelectronics, and biotechnology industries. 
Using mathematics, they are involved in such studies as thermodynamics. Chemical reaction processes, and process dynamics, design, and control. They help to develop new chemical products and processes. Test processing equipment and instrumentation, gather data, and monitor quality. Chemical engineers also build mathematical models and analyze the results. Mostly to help understand the performance of a process. In fact, the solution to a math problem is often in the understanding of the behavior of the process described by the mathematics, rather than the specific numerical result. How is mathematics used in chemical engineering? Mathematics is used a great deal in chemical engineering. Especially since chemical engineers design materials and the processes by which those materials are made. To solve chemical problems, many types of mathematics are used. Not least of which is calculus, including partial differential equations. Even simple calculations, such as working on chemical formulas and equations, involve mathematics. For more information about chemical formulas and equations, see Math in the Physical Sciences. Traditionally, chemical engineers worked in the petroleum and large-scale chemical industries. More recently, they have spread out to the pharmaceutical, food stuff polymer and material microelectronics and biotechnology industries using mathematics they are involved in such studies as thermodynamics chemical reaction processes and process dynamics design and control they help to develop new chemical products and processes. Test processing equipment and instrumentation, gather data, and monitor quality. Chemical engineers also build mathematical models and analyze the results. Mostly to help understand the performance of a process. In fact, the solution to a math problem is often in the understanding of the behavior of the process described by the mathematics, rather than the specific numerical result. What are some examples of mathematical models used by chemical engineers? There are numerous examples of how mathematical models are used by chemical engineers too many to mention them all here. One good example is modeling crystal growth. Liquids from water to molten metals become crystalline solids as they are cooled. Engineers can mathematically design software that helps in the manufacture of superior crystalline growth. Especially for electronics and other industries. These improved crystal forms advance the quality of electronic hardware, including computers. And help engineers design better alloys for a wide range of applications. What are some examples of mathematical models used by chemical engineers?
there are numerous examples of how mathematical models are used by chemical engineers too many to mention them all here. One good example is modeling crystal growth. Liquids from water to molten metals become crystalline solids as they are cooled. Engineers can mathematically design software that helps in the manufacture of superior crystalline growth. Especially for electronics and other industries. These improved crystal forms advance the quality of electronic hardware, including computers. And help engineers design better alloys for a wide range of applications. How is math used to understand chemical reactions? One of the simplest examples of mathematics used in understanding chemical reactions is based on two chemicals, A and B, they can be molecules or ions. If A and B encounter one another, they can rearrange themselves into molecules or ions of two other substances, in this example, C and D. The reaction that takes place can give off or absorb energy, making the molecules move faster or slower. Although this is a simple example of what can happen in a chemical reaction, it can still be analyzed using mathematical modeling. How is math used to understand chemical reactions? One of the simplest examples of mathematics used in understanding chemical reactions is based on two chemicals, A and B, they can be molecules or ions. If A and B encounter one another, they can rearrange themselves into molecules or ions of two other substances, in this example, C and D. The reaction that takes place can give off or absorb energy, making the molecules move faster or slower. Although this is a simple example of what can happen in a chemical reaction, it can still be analyzed using mathematical modeling. How are statistics used in industrial engineering? Industrial engineers study the efficient use of personnel, materials, and machines in factories, stores, repair shops, and offices. They prepare layouts of machinery and equipment, plan the flow of work, make statistical studies, and analyze production costs. In particular, they rely heavily on a branch of mathematics called statistics and probability. For more about statistics and probability, see Applied Mathematics. How are statistics used in industrial engineering? Industrial engineers study the efficient use of personnel, materials, and machines in factories, stores, repair shops, and offices. They prepare layouts of machinery and equipment, plan the flow of work, 
make statistical studies, and analyze production costs. In particular, they rely heavily on a branch of mathematics called statistics and probability. For more about statistics and probability, see Applied Mathematics. How is math used in statistical process control? Statistical Process Control, SPC Involves using statistical techniques to measure and analyze the variations within a process. With SPC, Industrial Engineers Monitor, Control, and Ideally, improve a process through statistical analysis. The four basic steps include measuring the process, eliminating variables within the process to make it consistent, monitoring the process, and finally, improving the process to make the, usually better, intended product. But it is not the answer to everything. All the SBC does is ensure that the product is being manufactured and designed as intended. Thus, SBC does not tell whether the design is good or bad, just if it's made according to plan. How is math used in statistical process control? Statistical Process Control, SPC Involves using statistical techniques to measure and analyze the variations within a process. With SPC, Industrial Engineers Monitor, Control, and Ideally, improve a process through statistical analysis. The four basic steps include measuring the process, eliminating variables within the process to make it consistent, monitoring the process, and finally, improving the process to make the, usually better, intended product. But it is not the answer to everything. All the SBC does is ensure that the product is being manufactured and designed as intended. Thus, SBC does not tell whether the design is good or bad, just if it's made according to plan. What is statistical quality control? Quality control has been around for a while in a crude sense. When a certain product was manufactured, and consumers chose that product, the makers would try to improve the quality of the product or lower its price. The improvement of the quality did not stop with the product, but also included the process for making the product. But the use of mathematics was minor in early quality control. It was not until the 1920s that statistics was applied to industry and quality control. Mainly because of the development of sampling theory. For more about sampling, see Applied Mathematics. Modern statistical quality control refers to using statistical techniques for measuring and improving the quality of processes, it is often broken down into statistical process control. 
SBC, C above, and Statistical Quality Control, SQC. Both terms are usually used interchangeably, although SQC has a broader focus than SBC. To compare, SBC is the application of statistical techniques to control a process. Reducing variation so that performance remains within specific limits. SQC is the application of statistical techniques to control quality and includes acceptance sampling. Inspection of a sample from a lot to decide whether to accept that lot, as well as SBC. What is statistical quality control? Quality control has been around for a while in a crude sense. When a certain product was manufactured, and consumers chose that product. The makers would try to improve the quality of the product or lower its price. The improvement of the quality did not stop with the product. But also included the process for making the product. But the use of mathematics was minor in early quality control. It was not until the 1920s that statistics was applied to industry and quality control. Mainly because of the development of sampling theory. For more about sampling, see Applied Mathematics. Modern statistical quality control refers to using statistical techniques for measuring and improving the quality of processes, it is often broken down into statistical process control. SBC, C above, and statistical quality control, SQC. Both terms are usually used interchangeably, although SQC has a broader focus than SBC. To compare, SBC is the application of statistical techniques to control a process. Reducing variation so that performance remains within specific limits. SQC is the application of statistical techniques to control quality and includes acceptance sampling. Inspection of a sample from a lot to decide whether to accept that lot, as well as SBC.